Welcome back to the English Hour here on ANN Satellite Television. Our guest today is former U.S. State Department diplomat Jonathan Mueller. Jonathan has served in places as disparate as Ecuador, Poland, and Azerbaijan. He has also worked on refugee policy in the State Department's Refugee Bureau. An American of German extraction since leaving the State Department, Jonathan has maintained his interest in international affairs, keeping his former colleagues up to the mark with advice as a policy guru and strategist. He has, and always has had, a keen interest in the Middle East. Jonathan Mueller will be speaking in his personal capacity and not on behalf of the U.S. government. Jonathan, it's really good to have you here on ANR Television. How should we begin? I really am quite interested by the dynamic we have, it seems, in the world today. With, for a long time, America was the um, had its had its particular Cold War enemy in Russia, and then along came the. 9-11 incident and, and for a while the is Islamic world became the pariah for the Americans and the, the interest, the whole focus of American policy was the Middle East and it seems it switched again or has it? Are we now are we seeing a, a switch to a new Cold War with Russia or is this a temporary blip? Well it's certainly not a new Cold War. I mean, there's no comparison between Russia today under Putin and the threat that the Soviet Union posed to the, the Western world in the, in the 50s and 60s and 70s and 80s. There's no comparison. I think it's very unfortunate, looking at the Middle East, I think it's very unfortunate the way things are going between the United States and Russia. You know, when I was in Baku in the late 90s, this was even before 9-11, but you could see certain things coming. We, we could see that President Aliyev, acting on the principle of my enemy's enemy is my friend, was allowing Al-Qaeda to stage their operations yes, in yes. Chechnya through, through mm -hmm. Azerbaijan under a live and let live agreement with the local services under which they weren't supposed to do anything in Baku, but that certainly didn't make us comfortable mm. going out the door and starting the <coughs> car in the morning. An echo of uh, the support for mm. Al-Qaeda in mm. Afghanistan in, in, in yes. trying to get fight the Russians there. Yes, yes, mm. yes. So I could, s but I could see even then that while there were conflicts in the region between the, m the United States and Russia, and in, in, sim in simplistic terms, there was a conflict over access to hi the hydrocarbon reserves of the region. While on the other hand, there was a real need to work together to pursue a common interest in keeping Islamic extremists out of the Caucasus and Central Asia. Mm. And, and, and now... And, and, and we, weren't re we weren't really pursuing the a, a closer relationship with the Russians on that. And now we're back. We, you think we will get back to a close relationship with the Russians with regard to the... Well, you've heard me say before that the key to resolving the conflict in Syria was for the United States and the Russians to work together. And I still believe that, but unfortunately that relationship has gone in the wrong direction for that to actually happen. And you regard that, however, as a temporary hiccup. You, you think that we will have the focus again on, on Syria in terms of U.S.? Well, the sort of cooperation that I would like to see bet between the United States and Russia is probably not coming under Vladimir Putin. We probably have to wait for a, a change of regime there. But th there's, also, there's also a need for the Americans to manage that relationship better. I mean, what I, the American ap approach to securing Russian cooperation on Syria in the past has been quite public hectoring and criticism of, of their closeness to the Assad regime. This problem, um, the American lack of engagement with Russia, if we have to wait for Mr. Putin to fall off his perch, then we're going to have to wait a long time because he's around and he's, he's up and healthy. Um, meanwhile, we have an unresolved situation in Syria are you saying that we can't act in while well, well the present status quo goes forward? Well, I don't know that Putin is with us for the long term. He, he may be healthy, but his economy isn't, and he may not be politically that healthy. And there, there are 
the, the, depending on the way things go in in Russia and the conflict so over Ukraine. Well, it's a big wish. I mean, could be. He doesn't have to be around for forever. I think he'd be around for a year or two. It may not be forever, but at the end of the day, we're stuck with him, and uh, for the time being. And given that this this tension exists between America and Russia, does the whole does the whole Middle East have to go on the back boiler? Uh, I mean, do we have to? Can we see no progress on on Syria? Well, we haven't seen any progress on Syria for for about three years now. So why why would we feel there had to be progress on Syria mm -hmm. in, the, in the near term? You don't think the Geneva talks were progress? The the Geneva two, Geneva one, Geneva two. No, I don't really think so. no so but nobody that nobody they can can rally around. You know, Assad has had his elections, which now he feels I think that 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 confirms his position. I've said before that it's very difficult for the Assad regime to really change because of the nat its nature and the the way it is is kept in power by the security services. He's a stuck. He's a stuck with this alliance with the security services, and yes, but I, I think from from Assad's position on this point, he probably feels he's had his election. He's made some gains militarily. He's he's not about to go, so he's going to stay. So he'll stay, and you see, um, you see Bashar al-Assad staying in power in Syria for the foreseeable future. Is what you're saying? There's no change to the status quo? I'm, I'm afraid, William, that's the way I... Well, well, what is changing in the status quo is some very, some very dangerous dynamics between Syria and Iraq, which we've just seen playing out yesterday in mm. ISIS's seizure of Mosul. But... Um, so the, the, si the, situation in this, the situation in Syria is not benign, and it's not just a Syrian problem. It's not just destroying Syria. It's that, that, I mean, I mean, mm. I mean as, as resigned as I may sound to it going on, there's no mistake that it is a tremendous tragedy, and Syria is being destroyed by this conflict. So but it's but ongoing. You see, um, you see the real pariah as the more extreme Islamic groups, um, ISIS, uh, classic, uh, what, they, what the Syrians call Daesh, and um, al-Nusra Front being the two major ones. Yeah. Um, and they are the focus of the, the main focus of the problem as far as you're concerned, uh, rather than anybody else. That's the main crisis is focused around these groups. Well, I, I don't know if I would say that's the main crisis. The main crisis is that there's a war going on in Syria, which is destroying Syria. But now, because of these groups, that problem is starting to spill over into Iraq. And you, know, you, you look at what is happening in Iraq, and you start to say, why? Why did we spend all, all those years and all those billions and trillions of dollars in Iraq? Because it, the whole thing seems to be un unraveling mm. right now. Mm. Iraq. Yes, and indeed, I suppose Afghanistan up to a point too, because these elections um, there are not entirely satisfactory, and the uh, the future there looks quite disturbing. But th I, I mean, I going back to two thousand and three, Afghanistan was a different situation. But certainly in two thousand and three, I thought that it was a really big mistake to invade Iraq. Um, you know, it's easy to talk about a threat and a danger and say that you can't live with it. But that's not reality. Reality is that the very business of being alive invo involves an element of risk. But we had and no choice, did we? I mean, to, to, inv to invade Iraq, that was a war of choice. Uh, was it really? I mean, you look, um, the, from the day Saddam invaded Kuwait and took strategically important oil fields, um, we had to push him out of Kuwait. Having pushed him out of Kuwait, um, the, uh, there was a measure of hubris involved, pride, if you like, on our part. We, we were um, distressed at the fact, the way that he, he was beating, the, beating us on every, at every level with regard to dodging the sanctions and, and generally um, cementing his position. And our press, our, our media, led us to war. I mean, we, we, we decided we would 
for our, the sake of our own pride, it was unavoidable. I mean, in 2003, do you think that was the doing of the media? Or was that the doing of, of the Bush administration and the, and the Blair government and, and a significant part of the media and the, the legislatures in both countries allowed themselves to be led down a path? Yes. I mean, clearly, there, there are many factors. But up to a point, the tail wagged the dog. The media was, was really building a bandwagon for war. Um, uh, certainly the red tops, the, the what we call the tabloid press. Um, but I, I, w I wasn't here then, and I have to say, I, life is too short to spend it studying what the red tops are saying. Yeah. But in, in terms of the, the major American news outlets, I think they did allow themselves to be led, but they were led by an, an administration and a, and a government here that that misused and manipulated in intelligence that, that really wasn't as compelling as they, as they claimed it was. And Saddam was, Saddam was contained. I mean, that's not to say that he was without any danger, but he was contained and we could have gone on containing him. And but he, it is he, 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 if, if, if we had not invaded, Saddam would be dead by now anyway. And it's hard to say what would have happened then, whether Kudai and Usai, Udai and Kusai would have would have somehow succeeded or yeah <laughs> well <I> forbid <laughs> a but scary I mean the, uh, a scary a scary proposition but but, but, but the point is that I, whatever the 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 way it works uh, a nation is a sort of living animal and however it uh, however it happens that whether it's the the leadership or the population or whatever there's an appetite for war or there isn't. And there was then, there isn't now. Um, no, there isn't now. Yes. But, but we, we, missed my, we really missed my point. My point was, in 2003, I was a dove. I didn't think that we should invade Iraq. Mm -hmm. By 2006, I still thought that we were, you know, even more than ever, considering what we've subsequently found out about the weapons of mass destruction, even more than ever thought that it was a mistake to have invaded, but that having invaded, having, I would really say, made a mess of the country, we needed to stay and sort it out. But mm. once Obama came into office, I think as long as Dick Cheney was around, there was going to be a high element of stubbornness about withdrawing. But once Obama came into office, then withdrawal became the clear goal. And in this sort of situation, it's fatal to say you are leaving. You but it, it, it does resonate with the will of the American well people. Well, it did resonate with the will of the American people, but in terms of accomplishing what we, what we set out to accomplish in Iraq and Afghanistan, saying we were going to leave was, was the kiss of death. Because yeah, but the days it meant of that everybody, everybody had to start positioning themselves for life after the Americans. But we're not in a colonial world today. I mean, you can't go in and stay in. Um, and given, uh, given the, uh, I mean, there, there are some pluses. Uh, Iraq's democracy, however flawed, is very vibrant. And I don't think it'll ever go. It'll be there forever. Um, at least I trust it will. The, uh, I suspect that, um, that, that Iraq will find a way of dealing with these these insurgents. I mean, part of the trouble for Iraq and for Syria are the, the big players outside these nations. I, ISIS, the group we're talking about, the Islamic group, is full of foreign fighters, foreign funded. Um, so is Jabhat al-Nusra. Uh, well, Jabhat al-Nusra has fewer, is more local fighters, but they're foreign funded again. Um, the, um, the international interference in, in Iraq and Syria has been colossal, wouldn't you say? Oh. Well, th this is the nature of war today. You know, th the Second World War was the last great war between great powers. There can't be another. The Second World War nearly destroyed Europe, and if there were another such war, it would destroy the world. So after the Second World War, we came to the age of the wars of national liberation, and they were somewhat messy, but they had a certain a certain pattern and you, you could to some degree see who was on which side and you had a restricted number of players. But starting with the
the civil war in Lebanon. I think is I think the civil war in Lebanon is a prototype for war in the modern world. These are what I call witches' cauldrons, in which you have a huge number of players, uh, state and non-state, domestic, foreign, both a country's neighbors and great powers like the United States, Britain, and Russia, coming from coming from a distance to intervene. You have political actors like terrorists. You have non-political actors like narcotics traffickers. You also have supposedly neutral actors like UN agencies. Mm. And the, the, whole, the, whole, the whole gamut of not-for-profit organizations. You know, when you go back and look at the war in Vietnam, you international organization mostly meant the ICRC poking around some prisoner of war camps and not saying anything publicly about the horrors they found on both sides. And you didn't, ha didn't have all these not-for-profit organizations mm -hmm. delivering relief. Relief was delivered by USAID or not at all. Interesting. So if you have these, these I mean, and then uh, not-for-profits are, are the least of the problem. What make, I mean, you could see in Afghanistan even when, when I was working on Afghanistan, 1998 to 2000, you could see that you know, just maybe the Afghans could work out their problems if mm. the foreigners would all go away. Yes, yes. But you start with the Pakistanis and the, in the Pakistanis and the Indians yes. were each too afraid that a stable Afghanistan would tilt towards the other one. To they were, they were more afraid of a of Afghanistan tilting towards the other one than of having chaos in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. And yes, very and from that then you then you get the Iranians and you get the Americans, the Russians. So which is Colton so seems an at uh, <laughs> an at And so so it's no surprise that Syria should be a witch's cauldron that, that that Iraq should be a witch's cauldron. This is this is just just normal. There is the other fact that though the Syria and Iraq are perhaps unique in a way that Afghanistan isn't really because they are on the fault line of the bigger Shiite Sunni war that seems to be going on this almost inter-Arab civil war um, that ranges across the Middle East from Lebanon, Syria, Iraq and in a, in a, in a milder way right down to Bahrain. Um, it's, it's a war of two ideologies almost um, that are seeking hegemony uh, in in the Middle East and or would you not view it in that way? I'm not sure ideology is uh, is the the right th way of describing it because I don't think the the, war the conflicts are about theological differences between the Shia and the Sunni but I mean in in Iraq it's clearly about a long history a long history of the the Shia of being oppressed by the Sunnis, a long history, a sporadic history of various outside powers trying to reverse that. The Americans weren't the first people to try to put the the Shia in charge. The British tried to put to end the Sunni dominance. Do you see this as a as a confrontation, a geopolitical confrontation across this fault line between great powers, Iran, Saudi Arabia? coming, facing each other off, or do you see this as a series of individual wars, um, the, the quite unique in their way, uh, Syria, Lebanon, Iraq? How do you view the picture? This? I think these conflicts in their origins are mostly local, but the existence of the conflict and the weaknesses of the, the local governments give openings for outsiders to intervene and make the conflict worse and make it more durable, harder to, harder to settle. So I would see a feedback loop, a vicious circle between the, the local and the more regional, the more regional actors where, with, where they feed off of each other and just make the conflicts worse and worse. So basically what we're going to see in terms of Syria and up to a point in terms of Iraq, is a continuation of the status quo and over time, inshallah, the party's getting exhausted and things settling down. You don't see a successful peace process as such in these situations. 
No, yes, I don't. I don't think that the. I, I think the Assad regime now thinks that they're winning, and the the opposition is too disunited, too fr too fractious, represents too many too many different factions, too many different interests to to give a united voice for for negotiating. But there never have settlement. been united oppositions. I mean, after the fall of the Shah. You had royalist opposition. You had um, the sort of Miriam and and her group. The, you had the you had so many different factions the, in the opposition. Um, at the end of the but day, but you had you had one you had one overarching leader, and that was Ayatollah Khomeini. Ah, to the Shah. But once you had the counter revolution in place, there were so many factions you could never get anywhere. You know, the um, you never had any method, any mechanism for restoring or providing some sort of alternative to the, to the mullahs in, in Iran because you have a disparate, disunited opposition. I mean, we're never going to unite oppositions, are we? They are disunited by the very nature. In Syria we have secular, we have religious, um, we, we have so many um, groups that it's not true. Uh, the West just backs one particular group, the Syrian National Coalition, a more religious and slightly, um, well, it's it's unrepresentative group and certainly with no backing on the ground in Syria, where on the ground many of the fighters, as you said, are Islamist or the, the pre-Syrian armies are remnant, but they have bear no, none of them bear any relationship to what we call the Syrian National Coalition. Um, and, e and, e and even that, when you get into who they are, is not that attractive. And y y you wonder what, what we are thinking and, and how our interests would be served if they ever came to power. I mean, the, the in fact, the voice of secularism in Syria seems to be the Assad regime. Mm, mm. Well, it's inevitable because the West is backing a a more Islamist opposition, isn't it? Uh, but, but having said that, um, the point is that if the West or the, the Russians or whomever wishes to really promote a peace process, in a sense it doesn't matter who negotiates with the Syrian government, it's the outcome that matters. Um, the negotiator can have very little credibility as long as the outcome is a process by which you have some form of democracy that is satisfactory to all parties, wouldn't you say? Well, the, the, the challenge in the Middle East is finding leadership who are willing to come to, come to an understanding. I mean, one of the discouraging things about Syria right now is that Lakhdar Brahimi threw in the towel. Yes, Brahimi. Brahimi is a great, uh, great. I, I've dealt with Brahimi on Afghanistan, and he's he's somebody I have tremendous, r tremendous respect for, and, and he is a great peacemaker. Somebody who is great at bringing people together, and he he threw in the towel. He, he, he felt that it was time that it was time to walk away from Syria. I mean, there are there is talk. The trouble I with the United Nations is it's such a, uh, uh, a tool of the great powers that it, it really is incapable of a independent action uh, outside the Security Council. So the UN Secretary General is really emasculated when it comes to making any decisions. But um, one would hope that they will appoint a successor to Brahimi. Uh, and there are a couple of names in the frame. There's an, I believe an Algerian uh, leader from the Algerian opposition, uh, Abu Talis, I think, and then there is another gentleman who was um, a dean at Alexandria University, I believe, and uh, one or two others. But given given the lack of any will on the part of the UN Secretary General or his in inability to operate without without the go-ahead of America, um, we're not seeing a new appointment made. It is really, uh, the, the UN Secretary General is in the, in completely unable to act by himself, isn't he? 
Well, the UN, the UN is a, com a complex and difficult organization, and you know, it, a lot of its weaknesses come from the idealism of the Americans when they set it up, when they did some things that, that weren't really realistic and created a monster that, frankly, if they are, th they are the ones who can reform this beast, but they prefer to take political pot shots at it rather than, than seriously engage with, with restructuring the UN to make it more effective. Mm. But you would like to see um, a new UN negotiator, and therefore, by well, you want to, you uh, yeah, sure, you want to have a UN negotiator. But that that's not th not really the point. The point is the, is the individual Brahimi, who's somebody who was tremendously experienced and tremendously capable and tremendously re respected, who who chose to walk away from this situation. Mm. Yes. He's tremendously old too. I mean, it may be. I mean, it's a very demanding job, um, possibly enough to try the patience of a saint. Um, Anything to do with Middle East peace tries the patience of a saint. What about? Uh, the, the uh, uh, go on. No, sorry. I was going to ask you to. Uh, well, really, you I know, if you if you look if you look back to the the great years of transition in the 1990s, there were transitions from unappealing regimes to at least more open regimes, regimes that created the possibilities of pro economic and political progress all over the world. And of all the people who led those changes, the one who, to in my mind, really stands head and shoulders above everybody else as a peacemaker and a reconciler was Nelson Mandela. Mm. Um, the Arabs have not yet produced a Nelson Mandela. They've produced people like Nouri al-Maliki, who, having come to power over the, on the basis of the, sh the Shia majority, has used that position to advance the interests of his party and the, sh and the Shia in general at the, at the expense of the previously oppressed Sunni. And you can understand where this is coming from, because because they got the short end of the stick for a long, long time, but that's not how you make peace. Yes, I suppose. But that granted that what we are looking for in the Middle East, I mean, you take Israel and Palestine. We're looking clearly for an Israeli de Klerk, aren't we? I mean, we have a Palestinian Mandela sitting in prison in the shape of Marwan Barghouti, but we don't have an Israeli de Klerk with the vision and the courage to to make peace and and so forth that it is the uh, it is the men of we need powerful not men not n not now rabin may have been that one yes but yeah. that was but that was cut short yes indeed yes a great tragedy for the world and for the middle east in particular well it's hard. i mean i mean I, d I don't i don't want i don't want to get too too excited about Rabin and what he might have done had had he not been mm. um, had he not been killed. That's just an unknowable thing. But he he was somebody who had gone down the road the mm. road of making peace. Mm. Do you? I mean, has uh, we've we've said up to a point that um, that the Syrian conflict has is paying a price for America's. Um, disunity with Russia, the, the same applies to the Middle East peace process, or is that enough, does that have enough energy in terms of uh, it being Obama's second term, in terms of Kerry having pinned his whole um, reputation to Israel-Palestine peace talks? I mean, I, d I don't see the I don't see the Russians as being nearly as big players in the the Middle East peace process. But what you have the millstone round the neck of the Middle East peace process. To mix a metaphor, is the way the APAC tail wags the American dog, the political influence of the Zionist lobby in the United States, which, going way back, has huge influence. You know. I'll tell you a little. I'll tell you a little story about how influential the, the Zionist lobby is. 
I was talking to a friend who is a PhD history history PhD candidate at the LSE about how through the 1960s Israel was a left-wing cause in Europe and America and mm. and the the voters who and the the Zionist vote in the United States was a democratic vote and apparently in the course of his first term Richard Nixon set out to change that I mean if you look at when did the real when the, 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 there had been American assistance to Israel before but when the real floodgates opened was about 1970, 1971, and it's just gone. It's just been continuing sewer pipe from the American Treasury to to the Israelis ever since, <laughs> which ex expa right. with expand <coughs> expanded and enlarged as a, re as a payoff. Is yeah, but I mean, the at the end of the day, so 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 I su I suggested to to this fellow who I shan't who I shan't name that this might be a journal article for him to go into how, how this happened. And he said, not going to touch it, not going to touch it. Because, you know, you know, when one of the differences in the Middle East is that when you do something that offends the Islamists, they, they rant and rave and declare fatwas and, and make all kinds of threats of violence, which mostly end up just splattering mud on, their on themselves. The Zionists don't respond that way. The, res the Zionists just ostracize you and destroy you professionally. So this fellow said he wasn't going to do this because he looks forward to a long, ac long academic career, and he didn't, wasn't going to. Well, it's interesting. I think. I mean, you. So, so, there, so historically, you may be right, but I, I'm not so sure today. There is a um, there's a boycott movement in America that's led by very respectable professors who are boycotting. Um, um, Israeli uh, produce that's uh, from the West Bank is much stronger than the boycott movement in in Britain. Um, there, there are there are various dynamics. Um, I mean, the the American Jewish lobby historically may be very powerful. I would say it is potentially very powerful should Hillary Clinton come become the Democrat president after Obama. But um, assuming that there's no Republican candidate of stature that can compete, uh, but but the uh, but the Republicans, uh, they I mean they have some independence of thought. Bush Senior gave Israel a run for its money. The um, Israel it has to be quite careful about its awkward relationship. The awkward relationship between Netanyahu and Obama has given Israel a lot of pause for thought. Um, Oh, undoubtedly, Kerry has been quite forceful. The question is whether there's the staying power to push a, a peace process ahead on the part of uh, Kerry and Obama now. I don't, you don't oh, clearly you don't think there is. I think people overrate the, this idea that this president, any president, will, will do what he thinks is right because it's his, his second term and he's not going to to be running for election again. It, it, and that may be true of the president, but you know, the, the, the things that he's done to get there are too, mu are too much of a straitjacket. And he still has a party. I mean, he may not be running for election, but the Democratic Party has another election to win. Because this and, is... And, and, the, Demo and, the, and the, the, the Democratic Party is probably the, the party that's more closely I, d I don't know. The Republicans have, a, have had a lot of ties to, to Netanyahu and the Israeli right. Yes. I mean, the, basically, you're painting a very bleak picture, uh, one in which we have little hope for resolution of the issues as regards to Israel and Syria and Iraq. And in Israel's, if, if we don't have some effective peace process someday, Israel with a population of less than, I mean, what is it, six million Israeli population, um, of whom a number are Arabs, 20, up to 20% are Arabs. The, unless, 
unless we have some sort of peace process, Israel's survival as a station, as, as, a, as a nation in the Middle East is questionable in the long term, isn't it? I mean, they do need a peace process. But they have a, they have a democratic process that has to, they have to go through their own democratic process and come to the conclusion that, that, mm. they, that they need peace as much as they need security. Mm. So you have this, um, this bleak vision of the Middle East, in effect, that you know, we, we have a situation in Israel, we have a situation in Syria, we have a situation in Iraq, on which we are not going forward. Um, I suppose the consolation prize is that we're, there is some rapprochement now between Iran and Saudi Arabia. There seems to be a, a shift there that may bring a healthier, more peaceful Middle East, would you say? I, I certainly seem to notice conversations going on that weren't going on before. There, ha there has been some press reporting about that, but the, the I think the real issue is in, in the staying power of the theocratic regime in Iran, which continues to hold on to power despite being horribly unpopular. Mm. But it does so by repression, really, doesn't by a it? By a combination of repression and by having a degree of unity that its opponents don't have. Mm. Mm. And it's interesting but at, this at, the same, at the same time, you could say that the biggest winners from the American invasion of Iraq were the Iranians because it eliminated one of their lar it took their two largest enemies, Saddam Hussein in the United States and put them at war with each other and in the end Saddam was dead and the Americans were, were, de were demoralized. Mm -hmm. And now you have a situation in, in Iran, in Syria where we've talked about the Americans and the Russians, so there are actually three outside players I think who have the capacity to influence events there and that's the, the Iranians, the Americans and the Russians. And the, right now, these elections that have just been pulled off seem to be very much an Iranian thing, and so we can see the Iranians now as the big winners again. Yes, well, uh, they have. I mean, they have their geopolitical interests in Syria, and they cannot afford to sacrifice Syria or Lebanon. They they need to hold on to these nations. They are very important to Iran, more so than Iraq, really. Um, in Iraq, they don't have the kind of leverage that they have in, in Syria and Lebanon. If the Iranians were visionary, they too would back a peace process. I think they might if they were included in the equation. But part of the problem is that America, again, stands against including Iran in any peace discussions uh, with regard to Syria. Um, possibly that's been America kowtowing to a Saudi um, position rather than being... Uh, so it's, 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 it's an Israeli position as well. Yeah, and do you think that is the... Yes, so America can't include Iran in any peace discussions because of the Israelis? Well, I don't know. I don't, I don't know, I don't know about, about can't, but the, the, the American relationship to the Iranians begins with with 19 se begins in 1979. It begins with the seizure of the embassy. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't think you should underestimate how much hostility to the Iranians that created and how, how deep-seated and how enduring that hostility is. And that influences the receptivity to, to any sort of discussion of Iran about their, nu about their nuclear program, about their, their support their support for terrorism. And yet we have, we are going to accommodate their nuclear program. We, we're going to cave in on, uh, on the, the Iraq reactor and so forth. I mean, we do seem to be moving that way. There have been these bilateral secret talks in Oman between the USA and, well, secret, everybody knows about them, but the, the bilateral talks between Iran and the USA on the nuclear issue in Oman, which has set the agenda, and uh, it's an agenda which will lead to Iran having 
its own nuclear power as it wishes to and in the way it wishes to. Uh, so America has, up to a point, caved in on the, on the nuclear issue, oddly. Or would you not say so? It's a little awkward for me to answer that because I have, I have friends who have written some things who, that have questioned whether how great an issue that ever was and whether the, whether the, the issue existed altogether because, because of American hostility to Iran and because of American suspicions of Iran. Mm. So it's so it may be it may be it may be no more than the Americans un unwinding an unreasonable p a, a position that was was unreasonable in the first instance. It's not unreasonable to fear that Iran uh, might acquire over time nuclear weapons. No, it's you know you can talk about Iran and you can talk about. Saddam Hussein having weapons of mass destruction. I would lose. I lose much more sleep at night over Pakistani and North Korean nuclear weapons than. I mean the. I think the mm -hmm. the the mullah the mullahs in Iran are an interesting lot because while they are theocratic at the same time, they are extremely practical men, who have, have I think have have played their international position with, with some skill, and I wouldn't expect them to, to do something, something irrational, even if, they even if they had a bomb. And I'm not convinced that they, want a, that they want a bomb. They would understand why they would want a bomb, because it would protect them from the United States. Mm. But even if, they, even if they had a bomb, I would have a lot of confidence in their rational handling of it. Interesting. Where in in Pakistan, it's not so much a question of the the rational actions of any particular government as the instability of the whole country. You don't know who who could end up controlling something there, and North Korea is just such a yeah, it's a nightmare. Mm. Um, you know, you can you can imagine North Korea saying saying, "Give us oil, give us food, or we will nuke Seoul." And, and, and there's the, the, the Americans have been much quieter and much more circumspect about about North Korea than than about about Iran. Is there such a thing as principled action in um, in terms of foreign policy today, or is it all pragmatic? I mean, you had the I'm a very very fond no. of Roosevelt's four freedoms, you know, freedom of uh, religion, freedom of expression, freedom from fear and freedom from want. Uh, but does, certainly it's, it's hard to see a rational human rights agenda in um, an era in which we're all uh, seeking rapprochement with China, who's one of, the, one of the most, has one of the most brutal records in terms of repression. repression on some people of anybody, and and we still have Guantanamo, despite you, you know. Uh, at the end of the well, day, it's it's not. I think it well, well, the world is a messy place, William. And I, I would look at the intervention in Libya. I think that was something. I, w I wouldn't say it was only done for reasons of principle, but I would say it was principally done for reasons of principle because it was seen as the right thing to do and. I think that the initial, the um, initial intervention, which stopped the attack on Benghazi, probably pre prevented a humanitarian catastrophe. Had Benghazi fallen to Gaddafi's forces, there would have been a mm. a bloodbath in the city and a huge out outpouring of people from eastern Libya across the desert into Egypt and across the Mediterranean towards Italy and Greece. And that would all been a humanitarian catastrophe. Mm. So I, I think that I think that the British, the Europeans, the Americans got involved there in order to ad address a problem. The problem was more complicated, more messy, didn't have the silver bullet that they would have liked. Mm. No, certainly not, given what's and going on you've now. Set off, you've set off a, you've set off a situation that leaves you wondering whether this is 
actually any better than having Gaddafi in charge. Mm. And hence, I but suppose... I, I would argue that, I would argue that in all of these situations, in there, there, is a, there are advantages to removing these regimes and allowing things, a process to begin. But the, the process can be messy. But because it was so messy in Libya, I mean, that is part of the reason for any, for the reluctance now on the part of the great powers to intervene anywhere else. Not that one necessarily wants to encourage them to do so, but that is, that is the case, isn't it? That the outcome of Libya has been such a mess that it's disturbed people. Well, I think, peop I th I think that Libya was a last gasp. I mean, the, for the Americans, the experience of Iraq I think, already satisfied their appetite for these sorts of adventures. Hmm. So we're going... Which is, uh, which, which is why we saw a very limited American role in, in Libya. We have this depressing situation and yet you, you are, I mean, despite the fact that America is going for a period of isolationism, you are not entirely unhopeful with regard to this continuance of the status quo in the Middle East. You, you hope to see the dust settle and some sort of calm descend like some gift from God or without a, an active peace process. Is that, is that what we're saying? Well, you have a, you have a, whole, lot of, you have a whole lot of different dynamics going on in, in the Middle East. And one of the problems is that you have regimes like the the regime in Iraq and the regime in Syria that have made it very difficult for new leadership to develop. And we saw this in the former communist world. That it, it takes a long time to fill to fill that void. So it will take it will it will take time to to develop the kind of leadership that it's going to take to move Iraq forward. So essentially we've got to endure, the Middle East has got to endure. Over time things may get better, but America will be more isolationist. Um, the, uh, do men uh, make history or does history make men? Are we, we are, you're, what you seem to be saying is we're waiting for the Mandelas or for the de Klerks, for one or two great figures to emerge great leaders in the Middle East that can help resolve these issues and in their absence, like waiting for some messiah, we just have to, we have to potter along as best we can. If you look back at the situation in, the, in Egypt and the Sudan in the, in the 1880s, after the modest uprising, after the fall of Khartoum and the death of Gordon, the British just withdrew from the Sudan for more than, it was more than 10 years before they came back. Mm, yes, well of course, they were humiliated, yeah. Yes, when they, ca when they came back, they came back with overwhelming force. And but there's no equivalent with regard to America. Well, America's not gonna come back after its humiliation 10 years, ru 10 years down the line and Well, the Americans, the Americans were humiliated in, in Vietnam, and when I started out in government, when I was working on on defense policy in the early 1980s, nobody wanted to talk about counterinsurgency. Mm, mm. But we we came back. I mean, we backed into it. We didn't know what we were getting in. We didn't go into Iraq or Afghanistan saying, "All right, we're ready to try our hand at counterinsurgency again." But we got ourselves involved, and we we did it again. So, but uh, so, but. We can't entirely take a back seat. We do have, um, and you've, you've highlighted it yourself, you, we, we do have this threat of Muslim extremist groups um, that ISIS and so forth in, in Iraq and Syria that are emerging and that are very dangerous to world stability. I mean, we can't just ignore these situations. No, and, and um, American isolationism is a very dangerous thing. I mean, the, the classic s example is how, how American fi international financial policy undermined the Weimar, Weimar Republic and, and restored the fortunes of a, what a, appeared to be a declining, vanishing, mm. lunatic fringe party called, called the National Socialists. <laughs> um, 
And this is, but this is a recurring. You're going to blame this is a re- uh, this America is a re- for the emergence of Hitler. No, well, no uh, that's that's not some that's not something that I've made up. That's 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 uh, easy easy to see that mm. American fi- American financial policy following the crash undermined economic recovery in Germany, and at that point. The the Nazis seemed to have peaked, seemed to be fading away, and they made a comeback on the back of mm. the economic crisis. So and, uh, American isolationism is a recurring theme, and it's a it's it's an unfortunate theme because the the Americans are the one power that has the ability to uh, to to s- embrace. The, the hopes of the rest of the world and, and, and lead other countries towards a better world. The Chinese aren't going to do that. The Chinese have n- no, no sense of themselves having that kind of power, even if they have the money now. The, Russian, the Russians aren't going to do that. Yes. So, is, is so it is, yes, so I, I so know. There's so, many, mm. there, there's so many places where you, you need American leadership. It is uh, only the Americans you think. I mean, um, it's not. Uh, it's not. Uh, it's not. It's not only the Americans. And I'm not arguing for American unilateralism. I think the 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 virtual unilateralism of Iraq in 2003, the unilateralism of 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 Bush and Blair, uh, that was not. That was not a healthy thing. Mm. So where do we go but from the, here? I mean, the if you look back to the 19 80s, though, you had a relationship between Bush the Elder and Reagan and Margaret Thatcher, which was, was much, more dyna- much more dynamic, much more two-sided. Hmm. So, but we don't have those leaders. We don't, I mean, we do, uh, Obama is quite a figure on the world stage, but he's a figure for retrenchment. He's well a figure I, for I'm go back. I'm go I, I'm, g- I'm going to be very perhaps rather provocative here and say, during the 2008 presidential election, I saw Obama as a gifted orator who was in many ways an empty vessel that everybody poured their hopes into. Mm -hmm. But he remains an empty vessel. He he remains somebody who, who listens to two sides, splits the difference and calls it wisdom. But maybe but I it's mean it's not necessarily wisdom. Well, insecure in, in uh, you know what? It was very poignant to me watching the D-Day ceremonies, 70th anniversary of D-Day ceremonies on Friday, because you had Obama there and you had Cameron there, and you had the Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh, mm. and watching them, you could see that the the Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh were both actually veterans of the Second World War. That, that's how long they've, yeah. been, they've been around. And the Duke of Edinburgh, had he not married Princess Elizabeth, might have gone on to a very distinguished career in the Royal Navy. But in any case, these were two people who understood the significance of what they were doing and have real affection for what I know the Queen considers to be her armed forces. And then you had Obama and Cameron, who, uh, as far as I can see, both have very little understanding or, or interest in the military instrument. And Obama is the kind of, of liberal who has just never had any interest in the military, who's very open but to being sold these technological solutions, the, 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 uh, you know, the idea that you can fight a clean war from 10,000 feet and have no casualties. Yes, it's a very dishonorable the use of drones. The use of drones. You know, and there and was and an incident. And counterproductive. You know, He's no, the over sh- o- I mean, yes. over, over sh- overshadow- overshadowed by <laughs> by but the fall of Mosul was an incident in Afghanistan where they used a B-1 strategic bomber for close air support with some so-called smart bomb and killed five Americans. Mm. Yes. Seri- I, no, serious friendly fire incident. And the, the, whole, the, whole, I mean the, whole, the whole drone thing is an example of this, this 
yes. this technological solution. And but nonetheless, had the, Obama the, been had Obama been Hillary Clinton, for instance, had Obama been uh, Bush Jr., had Obama been whomever, most uh, most of the politicians of the recent few years in America, we would have seen military intervention in Syria uh, by by the United States, and the consequences might have been well, heaven knows. Well. You know, we, you you mean after the the nerve gas attack? Uh, yes. So after well, the suspect, I mean, know, we were very I, I, diplomatically. The Russians really pull, really outmaneuvered us and pulled the rug out from under us on that one. But I think we were actually very lucky that they did it because I could see what was coming. It was really clear to me what was coming. What was coming was not some invasion of Syria. What was coming was what my friend Chuck Spinney calls a drive-by shooting. He, he coined this term after it was done in Afghanistan by Bill Clinton, the drive-by shooting with cruise missiles. We're going to fire off a bunch of cruise missiles from some destroyers and submarines in the Mediterranean, and, and mm. the, the, result was yes. going to be a, a, the result was going to be a demonstration of the ineffectiveness of that kind of intervention, maybe. So, you know, there there were things. There were. Th it might have been, been a lit. Have we been no a fly zone and so forth? So it might have been much more effective than one imagines. But anyway, it's 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 done and dusted. It's not well, going to happen. It hasn't happened. A no, anyway. I, I don't, I don't, I don't think a no fly zone was in the cards because I don't think we could enforce a no fly zone. You know, we. If you, you know the not just the numbers of aircraft, but the ability to generate flying hours has been dramatically run down over the last 15 years. Mm. You know, if you compare the number of sorties flown in Kosovo with the number of sorties flown in Libya, it, it, it's about, a, I may be wrong, but I think it's something like a quarter, a huge decrease in in the number of sorties. And one of the things that we saw in Libya, we couldn't maintain a patrol, so the regime forces could move in these little hops while they were waiting, wha <laughs> while they were waiting for, okay. for NATO to so fly down. Now, that was Libya. Libya was, was, was an easy one because it was so yeah. close to so many NATO bases. Syria would be much harder. They'd have much harder time maintaining a presence. So I think of, I think a no f a no fly zone. So it, it hasn't happened. It won't happen. And mm. indeed, the status quo mean is where we're at. We we're going to have to. I mean, we're just mean in some. I mean, mean, mean all along. Uh, all along, I've opposed in military intervention in Syria, not for some moral reason, but because I don't see any way of making it work. So, in conclusion, because we have to draw this to an end, all fascinating though it is, uh, in conclusion, if you, uh, uh, much of our audience is in, the, well, but most of our audience is in the Middle East, a strong audience in Syria, what positive note would you like to end on if you, a word of encouragement, Jonathan? Well, I would say that for this audience, which I guess is all across the Arab world, the future, it, it's, their future is in their hands. It is up to them, to for some of them, to find find the courage and the honor, to to lead their countries to a just future. Well, that's strong words and and well received. Thank you, Jonathan Mueller, very much for being our guest today on ANN. It's been my pleasure, William. Thank, Thank you. you.